And everyone said, amen. Praise be to God. Let's pray together. Would you join me? Lord, you are so good to us. In fact, great is your faithfulness. You never let us down. You haven't failed us yet, and you never will. So we come to this text, we come to this moment hearing your word, knowing that all we have, you've already given to us in Jesus. So Lord, our prayer is show us, show us Christ. We want to behold you. In so doing, we are changed. Not to just work harder to get better, but to behold more of who you are. Show us Christ. Oh God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word until every heart confesses that Christ is Lord. In your name we pray, amen and amen. It's so good to see you again. If you're watching this online, I hope that you'll uh, have access there. You see it on, online and on our website. It's always there. Uh, resource for this sermon to help you dive deeper and uh, throughout the week even as a quiet time for you in small groups so um, make sure you you click on that along the way let us know where you're coming from we've got people traveling all over the place but hey we're wrapping up it's hard to believe the summer's ending some of our parents are dancing with joy that kids are going back to school Um, others of us we know it's a busy season some for some uh, obviously we know it's a wild and crazy time, but it is exciting to get back to life. And, uh, we're so, it, we're so grateful that you're here today. Uh, paradox has been the title of this series and it's hard to believe it's, it's almost over. You can go ahead and turn to first Timothy. That's where we've been. We said that this is a paradoxical kingdom we live in this upside down kingdom where the strong are made weak, where the, where the last are actually first. We've said that it's a place where humility uh, dominates uh, instead of uh, this age of arrogance. It's, it's unity, as we've even talked about, sung about today, in the age of division. It's, it's following in the age of leading. It's weakness in the age of power. It's maturity in the age of youthfulness. It's all of those things. Today, we're going to talk about sharing in the age of keeping. And as we've done so throughout this uh, series, we're going to honor God's word by reading it together. This would have been read to a congregation much like ours um, when it was first delivered to the church in Ephesus. So we're going to do this. I'm going to read it over us. But would you stand in honor of God's word as I now read this text, our text for the day that will take us to the very end of the book today. Verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They're to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. You may be seated. So the twist in this message is immediately with the, uh uh-oh, the pastor's going to talk about giving. And I am because it's right in the text. But really, the twist is this. I'm going to talk about how to be rich. It came on a good Sunday. I want to talk about how to be rich. Because it actually says this is how we can be rich. And make no mistake today, the, the message really, this is not what I want from you or what you know, staff or others of us, your church wants from you. This is what I want for you. What I want for you is what this text reveals to us, how we can live in freedom and really experience a great joy and peace in this life, to be generous, to be rich 
in all the ways that matter. How many of you have been watching the Olympics? Everybody watching the Olympics? I love the Olympics. I think it's ending today, right? Uh, the, the closing ceremonies. I love, I love the Olympics with all the human drama and how it brings the nations together. There's just so much that feels a bit like the kingdom of God, but we make these people out to be heroes. They're just people, right? They're just like us. They happen to do certain things really well. One of the great stories that came out uh, was from the high jumpers event. I don't know if you saw this, um, but it captured my attention. Two of the best high jumpers in the world, you might imagine, uh, were competing. Qatar is Mutsa Essa Barshim, is his name, and Italy's Gianmarco Tambiri. They both had cleared 2.7 meters, that's uh, 7 feet 9 inches. Can you imagine? 7 9. So they were continuing on, so he was going to win the gold, and uh, they put it at 7 10. They both had tried that, uh, that height and neither cleared it. They had a decision to make. They looked at each other. These two guys are friends. There's always a story behind the story. And they decided to share the gold. They embraced. They were weeping because behind the story is not only they trained together, there were friends coming from different parts of the world. Um, Barshim had the, the Qatari uh, uh, jumper. He had, had gotten bronze in, in London in 2012, then bronze again in Rio 2016, been on this journey to try to win the gold finally. And when they realized, you know, we could keep jumping this thing off, but they said, no, they didn't even need to really say much. They just embraced each other. Let's do this. Let's, let's, let's win the gold. They shared the gold. Tim Berry had suffered a broken ankle, the Italian uh, high jumper, in 2018 in a meet in Morocco. So for these past uh, five years, he's been carrying around a, a cast that was on his ankle. They, they cut it off and he's been carrying it around. He had it with him. And on it, it said, Road to Tokyo 2020. Of course, then he marked it out and had to put 2021 <laughs> But it was a journey for the, for the both of them to get there. And when they realized they could share the gold, they just embraced and wept and rejoiced with one another. They shared the gold. This reminded me of the kingdom of God, this paradoxical kingdom where Jesus says it's not about who finishes first or last. It's about not counting. This is the whole parable of the, the vineyard workers. Not about who came and worked so hard. It's about not counting anymore. And I know in an age where we say, well, everybody wins trophies. You know, what's that all about? Well, the kingdom of God is about sharing the gold. It's about raising others up. And as Megan noted, one of our values we state here, our overflowing generosity, we share all we have. And so today I want to talk about that, sharing in the age of keeping. In 1 Timothy 6, now you might be like me. I often think of first century um, congregants who may have heard this message, first hearers, as low, poor, lowly people. And many of them were that, for sure. But Christianity, you may not know, spread among the wealthy in the first century. And it wasn't our theology that drew people in. That was always a little bit strange, right? Radical, actually, countercultural. It was the overfl overflowing generosity, the love of the people. We, we see this in the book of Acts, sharing all they had in community, caring for anyone who need, was in need. The question was, why are they so loving? And shouldn't this be the question that everyone's asking of us as believers? Not, not us hiding out in the church. I'm talking about living our lives out in the world this, this week. Why did you do that for me? Why did you open the door for me? Why did you come over? Neighbor, why did you give me this? Why, why did you do this thing? We, we share all we have and it creates this intrigue. I don't know much about what you believe, but I know how much you love. This is what, how we're to live. Now, if you're a guest and you're thinking, why do preachers always talk about money? Well, we don't always talk about money. Um, if we do so, we do so because Jesus talked a lot about money. In fact, we see that 16 of his 38 parables were about how to handle money and possessions. A, a surprising and amazing in the Gospels, one out of 10 verses is about possessions, explicitly about possessions and money. The better question is, why did Jesus talk so much about money? See, there's 500 verses or so on prayer in the Bible. There's 500 plus on faith. There's 2,000 verses on possessions and how to manage 
our money. Why is this? Because the chief competitor for your heart is your money and your stuff. That's why. God wants our hearts all for our good and to his glory. And more than any other thing in your life, if we're honest, it's your money or your pursuit of more that stands in the way. So, again, you've come on a really good day. I want to talk about how to be rich. Let's talk about that. How to be rich. Most rich people aren't very good at it, by the way. And I want you to be really good at it. If you're going to be rich, and it rarely happens because most people lose themselves on the way to becoming rich. And of course, immediately you're thinking, well, I'm not rich. It's kind of we all don't think we're rich, but we know someone who is, right? It's all relative. And so I want to think about that for a moment. When I did a, a word study, in fact, in the Bible, this, this past couple of weeks, I did a, a word study on rich, the word rich. And most often, you might know this, rich and wealthy in the Bible is often referred to in the negative. Like when you hear Jesus telling a story, well, there was a rich man. You go, uh-oh, this is not going to go well, right? Um, Zacchaeus was rich. Uh-oh, well, let's see what happens. I mean, we, right? Why is this? Because we know that oftentimes being wealthy or focusing on our stuff gets in the way of truly worshiping God. It's why Jesus said it's more likely easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven. Now he's using hyperbole. What does he say? It's impossible for that to happen. Apart from the transformation of one's heart. Why do we lose ourselves in pursuit of wealth? Why is it that so few wealthy people are truly happy people? And why is it that when you go among the poor, as I have done, not only here in Dallas, but around the world, why are they really more generous in terms of what they have? Why are they more joyful than many of us? A lot of that has to do with contentment, right? I think most of us think it's better to give than receive. And we've had moments in our lives where I get this, I want to do more of that when I give my time or care for someone or give money it feels yeah it's good I, I believe that and yet research proves that as we make more the less we give percentage wise the more people make the less they're able to release it and to give and I want you to be rich so here's what I'm doing if you take notes I got five uh, five ways that will keep you from being rich. So I'm going to flip this. You can't be rich, all right? You can't be rich until you know you are. Look at verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, okay, prideful or arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. You can't be rich, loving, content, a generous person until you realize how rich you are in this present age. The first hurdle we've got to jump over, rich people don't know they are. This is really intriguing to me. Smart people generally know they're smart. Tall people know they're tall. Rich people don't know they're rich. Uh, in our context, in particular. Again, it, it's, it's all relative, right? Forbes asked the question in a survey, how much would it take for you to be rich? I wonder if you could have, have a number in mind. And, and then, then what ha I read this article that was all about, that forced a lot of questions. Is it one's net worth? Is it income? Is it overall well-being? Wouldn't we all want to run there, really, in the context of the sanctuary? Is the context local? Is it national? Is it global? Depending on the definition, one could qualify as rich in one context and impoverished in another, right? This is really worth pausing and thinking about. In what context are you wealthy? Spiritual context? Understanding God's word, wealthy in, in scripture and in knowledge of his word. Where are you wealthy? Because there's a lot of ways to define wealth. Where is your focus? And by the way, that number is just over $2 million. I'd be wealthy if I had $2 million this is where it landed. Do you know that 6 to 7% of all people in the world own a car? Not all of us own a car here. But a lot of us do. If you make 30000 a year, you're in the top 4% of wage earners in the world. If you make 60000 a year, you're in the 1 percentile across the planet. 99% of the world 
has less than you. See, nobody's rich, but everybody knows somebody who is. It's all relative. And you might even be thinking, well, Jeff, how does that have, what does that got to do with, with where I am? I, I get it. I'm a lot wealthier than others. First, an act of praise to what God has given to us can be a blessing, can be a curse. But he, he wants us to be content with what we have. Notice that the word in verse 17, charge them. I was thinking of young Timothy as I was looking at this text. Uh, this is a young pastor and, he, and he's preaching to, to those who are wealthy in his congregation. This is a military word. Command them. Charge them. Those who are wealthy. He's not dispensing. Here's my point. He's just not dispensing helpful hints or financial advice. He's offering God's word to them. As I am doing today. You can't be rich until first you know you are. Secondly, you can't be rich until you know where your wealth comes from. Look at what he says. Don't be haughty. Don't be arrogant. Why is this his first command? Or, or how does he know this? Because that's the way it goes. Pride accompanies wealth. Arrogance almost always comes along with wealth. I'm rich. Here's how we get, here's what we do. I'm rich because I'm smart. We actually flip that. I'm smart because I'm rich. Because I'm wealthy, because I have so much, I'm savvy, I'm better, I'm harder working. This word haughty literally means high-minded, lofty in mind, higher, better than others, conceited. It's the only time in the New Testament this word is used. Because, see, greed this, this thing of pursuit of more wealth creates this unique kind of pride. In other words, I'm, I'm rich because of me. I'm the reason that I have what I have. It's about me. You see how that goes. You've probably heard someone say, as probably I have somewhere along the way, he or she is really wealthy, but you would never know it. Why do we say that? Because generally you know it. That's why. And it's not just, well, because, wow, they dress nicely or, whoo, they look good. There's a sense, there's, there's often a pride or a hubris. There's, a, there's an arrogance. You know it. Sense of superiority, perhaps. Proverbs 18, 11 says, a rich man's wealth is his strong city. And a, a, like a high wall in his imagination he gets that? Rich people think they're going to earn their way to security, accumulate their way to safety. Could I say it? Acquire their way to salvation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who sees anything different in you? Now speaking to us, believers. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? All of life is a gift, is what he's saying. Listen, life is a stewardship. It's a gift. It's temporary and you're accountable. You and I are accountable. Everything we have has been given to us. We're breathing today. You woke up today. I don't know if you've thought about this. Your heart is beating in your chest. No cords attached. No strings attached. God is keeping you alive. We got up today. Today is a gift. Life is a gift. Everything we have is his. We are stewards. We're not owners. Be reminded of that today. Thirdly, you can't be rich until your hope is in God. Look at what he says. Don't, don't place your hope in riches. Why? Look at that. Because, can I say it? Because it's dumb. That's why. It's uncertain. It's up and down. God is the one who doesn't change. He's steadfast. He's immutable. He is the one who's certain. And the most dangerous aspect of wealth is this. As your income increases, your hope will begin to migrate. This is why we lose ourselves on the way. It will move, it will drift, it will migrate from God to your stuff over time. And today is a really good day to say, well, I'm sure that's happened with me in some form, some way. So Lord, how has that happened? Riches are uncertain. Proverbs 11.4 says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Righteousness. Christ's righteousness covering us is what delivers us from hell. The old adage, you've never seen a hearse pull in a U-Haul, right? You think about this. What is Rockefeller's 
net worth today? Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, someday Elon Musk. What is your, my net worth going to be someday? Zero is what it'll be. Zero. Where are you investing all that you've been given? And I just got to pause here in these challenging uh, verses and just say there's so many. I'm looking across here. Uh, the church that I love, my people, so many of us are so generous with what we have. They often say this, if you have a little, give a little. If you have some, give some. If you have a lot, give a lot. All of us have a part in this. I was talking to some of our youngest staff members this week and some of our young people in our church, everybody can do something. And he's telling us, be, be willing, be ready to share. Part of the challenge is there. I've talked to a lot of young people. I, I, I wish I could give or I'm still in school or I'm so strapped with debt and loans or whatever. I can't give like I want to. See, be ready to share means that you're in a position managing everything else you have By giving first, giving first. And then from that, first fruits, right, is the concept in scripture. But some of us are so financially strapped, we can't give in the way that we should. And so this number four, I want you to see this. You can't be rich until you're content with all other, all that you have, everything you have until you're satisfied in God is where this goes. Often rich people are plagued with discontent. All of their lives. When you feed an appetite, you see it grows. Do you know that? You, you, you satisfy an appetite. It doesn't diminish. It increases. It expands. To diminish an appetite, you have to starve it. How much would it take for you to feel that you have enough? Think about that. There's the law of diminishing marginal utility. This is, a, this is an economic term. It states that all else equal, as consumption increases, the marginal utility, okay, a word that, that really is, is what represents happiness, okay, or satisfaction. As things uh, are, are derived from that, marginal uh, utility becomes less and less. Each unit declines. In other words, it's the law of diminishing returns. That, that, that it's, the, it's the paradox of hedonism that we've talked about. This is, this is a philosophical thing. It's not a Christian thing, but it's true. All truth is God's truth. It is this. You, you don't become happy by pursuing happiness. Doesn't happen. You, pursue, you, you, you become happy by pursuing something else. And this plays here. We become happy. Blessed is what Jesus said. Blessed. Not by pursuing happiness, by pursuing more, but by pursuing him. By pursuing someone else, then we find peace, then we find joy, we find happiness. Have you figured that out yet? Oh, I want you to be free. How much would it take for you to really feel like you're set free from all the anxieties of your stuff, your, your, your house or your rent or, or caring for your your loved ones, your children, or your grandchildren. How much would be enough? How much is enough? That's the question. And the answer is what? More. The answer is more. And generally, the answer is always more, more than you currently have. I need more to take care of myself or more to feel secure, more to care for my children or my grandchildren. Your trust, look at this, is, is not in your children you don't trust your kids evidently you don't trust God your trust is in your stuff your, your trust is shifted and, and I would just say this are you spending more time to provide materially for your children or grandchildren or spiritually are you pouring into their lives spiritually or even into the next generation as a church because here's the truth we talk about it often more will never be enough More of this world will never be enough. Why are poor people more generous than wealthy people? Because they don't put their hope in their wealth. They can't. And so they're more generous with what they have. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4, 11 through 13, he he speaks of being content. He says, I've learned to be content in all things. I I learned how how to have much, how to have very little. And I'm content because my hope is not found in the stuff of this world. 
And this is where he says, often attached to sports and, and yeah, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's way out of context. He's saying, I can live with a lot. I can live with nothing because I can do all things because Christ is the one, not my stuff, that strengthens me. So finally, here it is. You can't be rich until Jesus is enough. You can't be rich until Christ is this explosive uh, power in you of a new affection that dominates all of your other affections. It's not that our desires, God doesn't say don't desire anything, don't treasure anything, don't be rich. No, he says be rich. Be rich in him and pursue him. Are you content? Are you anxious or do you have peace in him? Look at what it says in verse 18. Now we get to the heart of the passage. Okay, They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. It's three commands here. Here's the charge. And then he says, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that, here it is, the purpose, they may take hold of that which is truly Zoe life, abundant life is found if we live this way. What a great day for us to look at this passage. Here it is in verse 18, how to be rich. Be rich. Now I did a a study, a deep dive into the meanings of these three commands. Here it is, you're rich through selfless actions toward others. We can practice this today. Be rich in good works. And that's what it means. Be selfless. And another, through extra, be, by being extravagantly generous is the language. Literally, to impart, ready, eager, willing. It's not just, well, I'm gonna give a little something. No, this is imparting to someone something that's above and beyond. And then this last part here, I love this, where it says share, He says, be ready to share. This is inviting others in to share. You probably have heard the word koinonia. Anybody? It means fellowship, right? It means common unity, common good in Christ. Communion in him. This word is koinonikos. It's derived from the same word. it's, It's giving and loving in context, in view of relationship. Even towards relationship. I want to reach out to you and give and share. What I have so that I might know you and love you well. First Thessalonians 2, 8, Paul alludes to this when he says, hey, we came not just to share uh, our, the gospel, we shared ourselves with you because you became so dear to us. This is what our neighbors need. This is what our friends need. This guides so much of our giving here in our church. You may know that. We, don't, we do at times give to people that will never meet this side of glory. But our giving, our ongoing giving, is in partnership with people that we know and love here in the city and around the world. We want to go deeper in relationships, relationships that lead to discipleship, love, and the gospel being shared with the people. And so even now, we have the opportunity. Let me get real practical as as we start to land this. We're at a place right now where we as a church family are giving a uh, portion of our budget is going, but we, are, we have a privilege and opportunity to give to, uh, for the next generation. You know that our, 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 our children's space, kids' space is being uh, finished up. We're going to be announcing soon, but it's still in the works. But this fall, it's going to open up for the next generation of kids who are going to learn about Jesus. We have about $1.7 million um, that we can, we can pay off that debt. And friends, listen, we'll be debt free. Here's my charge. This is what I want us to do. I want us to be debt free by the end of this year. And I believe we can do it. Because all of us can do our part. And if you want to give towards that, if you want to talk to me about that, contact me in my office. You can call Rodney Shell. But we would love to say, yes, let's be debt free so we're ready to give. Can you imagine our church, this church, completely debt free and able to say, we are ready to give? Just recently, you met, some of you met our, our new residents. We have a new residency program here, raising up next generation leaders. I met with them this week as they're in training every week and incredible group of residents that we celebrate as a staff uh, to join us. This was made possible. I can, I can say this. Uh, a couple in our church said, hey, we've sold a, a business. We really want to do something special. 
And we started to talk. What are your interests? What are your passions? Let us tell you some things that are happening. When we talked about the residency program, they lit up. And they said, this is exactly what we want to give to. To the next generation of leaders. And because of their gift, great gift, this program is now in place. Praise be to God. I'm saying that because some of us have a little, give a little. Some of us have a lot. Give a lot. And we can all do our part. Praise be to God for those of you who have great means. God has given you the ability to do so. Praise him for it. So how can we take hold of that which is truly life? I'll close by asking the question, because it's a good one, a diagnostic question. How do I know if my wealth has become an idol, become a God for me, right? How do I know? I always ask this of, of the text. How would I know if I'm doing this thing that he's prohibiting? Two ways you're gonna know. One is implicit, the other is very explicit. The first question, I'll answer two questions with a question, the question with two questions. Where is your treasure? This is Jesus' question, right? In Matthew 6, 21, he said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Whatever you treasure is where your passion, your energy, your life will run. That's your God. And so he says, identify your treasure. In in practical terms, what do you think about? What gets you excited? Where do you spend all your time? Where does your mind run? And this may not be just money today. Uh, here's what I learned many years ago that's helped me to ask the question. Uh, my, deepest, my deepest emotions point me to my idol. What makes me angry? What makes me frustrated? What makes me nervous? What makes me, you know, what might I lose? What do I fear? Uh, how, how, what makes me really, really upset? Point you to your idol. That's worth digging underneath. That is a great exercise for you, even this week. Wherever your hope lies, that's your functional God. And, and Jesus says, give me, make me your treasure, then I'll have your heart. And then the second question is real clear. It's explicit in the text. Are you a giver? That one's easy. And it's in the text throughout scripture. It's undeniable. Do you share what you have? Are you a giver? Then you're not clinging to it so tight. Maybe it's not an idol. What about you today? Then he closes with verse 20. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. This is for all of us. Avoid irreverent babble. Avoid talk show religion and all of the opinions and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge instead of scripture. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And then he closes, grace be with you. I'll close with this summary of this text here today. Don't put your hope in the things God provides. He provides all things. Put your hope in the God who provides all things. You see, we're to give our lives to him because, watch this, 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Wow. That's the great exchange. We are never more like Jesus than when we give. Of our time, our resources, some of you need to serve in some way here in the church. Commit, it's a great time to commit. We're having training even today for preschool ministry and other ministries that you can be a part of. Contact us. We want you to be free, to be generous and to experience the joy of serving Jesus. So Jesus won the goal for us, didn't he? We didn't just have a broken ankle. We we couldn't compete. We couldn't jump. He had to step in for us He stepped out of the stands. Philippians 2 says, out of heaven, he stepped in and he ran the race for us. He jumped for us. He won the goal for us because we could not. We couldn't bring anything to the table. And he stepped in to be our substitute. Praise be to God that though he was rich, he became poor for us. So that in his poverty, we might become rich. Grace be with you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word to us today. 
Thank you for your grace. Again, all of life. From the first downbeat today, we've been reminded everything is in response to what you have done for us. Thank you for winning not just the gold, but for allowing your righteousness to be poured into us so that we might be forgiven. And Lord, I pray for those who are here today that need to talk further about that. That we would have a conversation. That we would, we would be certain that we are saved, that we've received the grace, won the gold that you have captured for us. And so, Lord, we give to you our lives. May we be generous this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.